The sunlight that floods the earth is the ultimate source of energy that keeps the planet functioning. Solar energy arrives as light in particles of energy, known as photons. When these photons reach the atmosphere, land, and water, some are transformed into another form of energy, heat, that warms earth, warms the atmosphere, drives the water cycle, and causes the currents of air and water. Some of these photons reach the plants that are transformed into photochemical energy used in photosynthesis. The energy stored in the chemical bonds of carbohydrates and other carbon-based compounds becomes the source of energy for other living organisms. In this way, the story of energy within an ecosystem is in large part a story of carbon in formed organic matter. The living and the dead tissues of plants and animals. Energy flows in ecosystem supports life. Energy exists in two forms, potential and kinetic. Potential energy is stored energy. It is capable of and available for performing work. Kinetic energy is energy in motion. It performs work at the expense of potential energy. Work is at least of two kinds, the storage of energy and the arranging of ordering of matter. Energy is governed by these laws of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics states that energy is neither created nor destroyed. It may change form, pass form from one place to another, or act upon matter in various ways. Regardless of what transfers and transformations take place, however, no gain or loss in total energy occurs. Energy is simply transferred from one place to another. When the wood burns, the potential energy lost from the molecular bonds of the wood equals the kinetic energy released as heat or also known as the thermal energy. When a chemical reaction results in the loss of energy from the system, the reaction is exothermic. On the other hand, some chemical reactions must absorb energy in order to proceed. These are the endothermic reactions. Although the total amount of energy in any reaction, such as the burning of wood, does not increase or decrease. Much of the potential energy degrades into a form incapable of doing further work. It is transferred to the surrounding environment as heat. This reduction in the potential energy is commonly referred to as the entropy. The transfer of energy involves the second law of thermodynamics. The second law states that when energy is transferred or transformed, part of the energy assumes a form that cannot pass on any further. As energy moves through an ecosystem, much of it is lost as heat of respiration. Energy is degraded from a more organized to a less organized state or entropy. However, a continuous flux of energy from the sun prevents ecosystems from running down. The flow of energy through an ecosystem starts with the harnessing of sunlight by the green plants through a process referred to as the primary production. The total amount of energy fixed by this plant is gross primary production. The amount of energy remaining after plants have met their respiratory need is net primary production in the form of plant biomass. The rate of primary production is the net primary productivity, which is measured in units of weight per area per unit time. The structure of terrestrial ecosystems is largely defined by the dominant plants, which in turn reflect the prevailing physical and environmental conditions. 
Geographic variations in climate, primarily temperature and precipitation, govern the large-scale distribution of plants and, therefore, the nature of terrestrial ecosystems. Temperature influences the photosynthetic rate and the amount of available water limits photosynthesis and the amount of leaves that can be supported. Warm, wet conditions make the tropical rainforest the most productive terrestrial ecosystem. In addition to climate, the availability of essential nutrients required for plant growth directly affects ecosystem productivity. The availability of nutrients in the soil influences the rate of nutrient uptake, photosynthesis, and plant growth. The net result is a general pattern of increasing productivity with increasing soil nutrient availability. Electromagnetic radiation emitted by the sun covers a wide range of wavelengths. Of the total range of solar radiation reaching Earth's atmosphere, the wavelengths of approximately 400 to 700 nanometer make up visible light. Collectively, these wavelengths are also known as photosynthetically active radiation or PAR because they include the wavelengths that plants use as a source of energy in the process of photosynthesis. Light is also a primary factor limiting productivity in aquatic ecosystems, and the depth to which light penetrates is crucial to determining the zone of primary productivity. Nutrient availability is the most pervasive influence on the productivity of oceans. The most productive ecosystems are shallow coastal waters, coral reefs, and estuaries, where nutrients are more available. Nutrient availability is also a dominant factor limiting net primary productivity in lake ecosystems. In rivers and streams, net primary productivity is low, with inputs of dead organic matter from adjacent terrestrial ecosystems being an important source of energy input. In many aquatic ecosystems, a substantial proportion of organic carbon is derived from dead organic matter from adjacent terrestrial ecosystems. The relative importance of external sources of organic carbon varies widely among different aquatic ecosystems. In large rivers, lakes, and most marine systems, the majority of organic carbon is derived internally from photosynthesis by autotrophs. In contrast, in smaller streams and lakes, the dominant source is often external sources of organic carbon. The process of plant growth functions as a positive feedback system. For a given rate of photosynthesis, the greater the allocation of carbon to photosynthetic tissues relative to non-photosynthetic tissues, the greater the net carbon gain in plant growth. The energy fixed by plants is allocated to different parts of the plant and to reproduction. How much is allocated to each component is a function of the plant life form as well as the environmental conditions. The pattern of allocation will directly influence standing biomass and productivity rate. An ecosystem that withstands time and age has a varying primary production. Both photosynthesis and plant growth are directly influenced by seasonal and yearly variations in moisture and temperature. Regions with cold winters or distinct wet and dry seasons have a period of plant dormancy when primary productivity ceases. In the wet regions of the tropics, where conditions are favorable for plant growth year-round, there is little seasonal variation in primary productivity. Disturbances such as herbivory and fire can also lead to year-to-year -year variations in net primary productivity. Overgrazing of grasslands by cattle and sheep or defoliation of forests by such insects as the gypsy moth can significantly reduce NPP. Fire in grasslands may increase productivity in wet years, but reduce it in dry years. In ecosystems dominated by woody vegetation, net primary production declines with age. As the ratio of woody biomass to foliage increases, more of gross production goes into maintenance. Net primary production is available to consumers directly as plant tissue or indirectly through animal tissue. 
Once consumed and assimilated, energy is diverted to maintenance, growth, and reproduction, and to feces, urine, and gas. Change in biomass, including weight change and reproduction, is secondary production. Secondary production depends upon primary production. Any environmental constraint on primary production will constrain secondary production in the ecosystem. Although there is a general relationship between the availability of primary productivity and the productivity of consumer organisms across a variety of terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, within a given ecosystem, there is a considerable variation among consumer organisms in their efficiency to transform energy consumed into secondary production. Endotherms have high assimilation efficiency but low production efficiency because they have to expend so much energy in maintenance. Ectotherms have low assimilation efficiency but high production efficiency. They put more energy into growth. These estimates of efficiency can be used to quantify the flow of energy through the food chain. A basic function of the ecosystem is to move energy from the sun through various consumers to its final dissipation in a series of energy transfers known as the food chain. The various members of the food web can be grouped into categories called trophic or feeding levels. At each trophic level, estimates of the efficiency of energy exchanged are defined as consumption efficiency or the proportion of available energy being consumed, assimilation efficiency or the portion of energy ingested that is assimilated and not lost as waste material, and production efficiency or the portion of assimilated energy that goes to growth rather than respiration. Autotrophs occupy the first trophic level. Herbivores that feed on autotrophs make up the next trophic level. Carnivores that feed on herbivores make up the third and the higher trophic levels. Energy flow in the ecosystems takes two routes. One through the grazing food chain and the other through the detrital food chain. The bulk of production is used by the organisms that feed on dead organic matter. The two food chains are linked by the input of dead organic matter and wastes from the consumer food chain functioning as input into the detrital food chain. The relative importance of the two major food chains and the rate of energy flow through the various trophic levels can vary widely among different types of ecosystems. Consumption efficiency determines the flow of energy through the ecosystem. The detrital food chain dominates in terrestrial ecosystems with only a small proportion of net primary productivity being consumed by the herbivores. In open water ecosystems such as lakes and oceans, a greater proportion of primary productivity is consumed by herbivores. Consumption efficiency of predators is more similar among these ecosystems. Not all energy is used for production, hence the pattern of the quantity of energy flowing into a trophic level decreases with each successive trophic level in the food chain. An ecological rule of thumb is that only 10% of the energy stored as biomass in a given trophic level is converted to biomass at the next higher trophic level. A plot of the total weight of individuals at each successive level produces a tapering pyramid. In aquatic ecosystems, however, where there is a rapid turnover of small aquatic producers, the pyramid of biomass becomes inverted. The sun is essential to life on earth because it provides energy. The sun warms our seas, steers our atmosphere, generates our weather patterns, and gives energy to the growing green plants that 
provide the food and oxygen for life on earth through photosynthesis. Animals that eat plants and the animals that eat those animals depend on the sun because they depend on plants to give them energy. Nothing is more important to us on earth than the sun. Without the sun's heat and light, all the water on the planet's surface would be frozen and the earth's atmosphere would likely dissipate, leaving the earth a lifeless ball of ice-coated rock.